So with Daredevil Season 2 coming out this week, what I wanted to do here is have a discussion on Elektra. And what I'm hoping is that at the end of this video, you'll have a strong understanding of her character, as well as why she was created to be a part of the Daredevil line of stories. So for those of you who have not seen my video on Daredevil Explained, which you'll find in the description, we had talked about how his character had gained a significant amount of popularity following his introduction by Stan Lee and Bill Everett in 1964. Where some of this has been due to the fact that he was created as a blind hero with enhanced senses due to exposure to radioactive material, this popularity was short-lived in that with Jerry Conway taking over the title with issue number 72 in 1971, instead of continuing the themes established by the Daredevil series, he instead moved the publications over to a Pulp Fiction format reminiscent of the pre- and post-Golden Age Superman Pulp comics, focusing largely on science fiction. This combined with Conway also moving Daredevil over to San Francisco had largely alienated the existing Daredevil fanbase who had grown accustomed to seeing Matt Murdock operate as a borderline anti-hero in Hell's Kitchen, New York, facing some of Marvel's seediest enemies. Furthermore, in the face of fan reaction to Jerry Conway's writing, between the conclusion of Conway's run with issue number 98 in 1971 running up until issue number 142 in 1975, Marvel had brought a series of writers on board, including Steve Gerber and Tony Isabella, both of whom were unable to bring interest back to the series. Where the title was handed over to writer Marv Wolfman with issue number 143 in 1977, because both he and Lynn Wine were serving as editors following the promotion of Roy Thomas, editor-in-chief, with the workload being too much to handle, Wolfman stepped down as editor and decreased his workload as writer, leading to a departure from the Daredevil title after 20 issues, where he shifted his focus to developing Spider-Woman Jessica Drew, Amazing Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and Doctor Strange. To this end, the title continued to see another slump in sales and a series of writers with short stints in the form of Jim Shooter who wrote for 9 issues and Robert McKenzie who wrote for 16, both of whom were unable to recapture the anti-hero element of Daredevil's character due largely to the fact that those readers who were looking for anti-heroes found it in the creation of The Punisher in 1974 by Jerry Conway and John Romita Sr. However, partway through McKenzie's run on the title, Frank Miller had been brought on board as a young artist looking to make his bones in the industry. Because Daredevil wasn't really considered a top tier title at the time in Marvel Comics despite having been around for so long, Frank Miller was partnered with Robert McKenzie to ink the series, but also offer input on the direction of the stories themselves. Where McKenzie did have complete control, while the stories he wrote didn't necessarily identify with prospective fans, the artwork of Frank Miller did, meaning that when McKenzie was removed from the Daredevil series in 1980 with issue number 166, under the direction of the new editor-in-chief Jim Shooter, Frank Miller was positioned as writer and artist of the series. However, the problem faced by Miller was that between the writing of Jerry Conway, Steve Gerber, Jim Shooter, Tony Isabella, and Robert McKenzie, the Daredevil line was on the verge of cancellation, meaning that he may very well have been put in charge of a title destined for the chopping block. Using this to his advantage, when he was granted the position of writer by Jim Shooter, Miller also leveraged complete control with the authority to take the title in whatever direction he deemed appropriate. And so with this newfound authority over the title, Frank Miller engineered a wholesale reboot of the Daredevil line, eliminating characters he didn't like, keeping the characters he did, inventing new characters, and retelling origin stories, all while completely ignoring virtually all past continuity of the character. While this did anger some of the reader base who would enjoy the stories of McKenzie and Wolfman, the argument of Miller was that in order for Daredevil to succeed, he needed to be a character like the Punisher whose morality was known, but oftentimes questionable. Where Miller went on to reboot Daredevil's origin and change his father, Jack Murdock, from a kindly man to an abusive alcoholic, Miller also sought to replace Daredevil's rogues gallery with a base of villains who were darker and more sinister, with more ambiguous motives, hailing from all corners of the globe, by way of Matt Murdock's own past. Making her debut with Daredevil issue number 168 in 1981, the appearance of Elektra initially came without a backstory beyond her first encounter with Matt Murdock. What we're told is that with Daredevil pursuing a villain named Ulrich Wallenquist, in the midst of interrogating a man by the name of Turk, the efforts of Daredevil to gain the information he needs are interrupted by the appearance of Elektra. In addition to this, because Daredevil's interrogation of Turk was cut short by a man named Bilge who caused an explosion which appeared to kill Turk, the impact of the blast had temporarily rattled Matt Murdock's senses, meaning he could still detect Bilge and question him on why he killed Turk, but was unaware of Elektra lurking in the background. Making her move and taking Daredevil by surprise, where Bilge is able to make his escape, Elektra reveals that there's actually a bounty on Wallenquist which she intended to collect. Now because this story was designed to introduce us to Elektra and explain her relationship to Matt, with Daredevil being overcome by her assault and blacking out, Miller takes the time to provide a flashback. And what he tells us is that during his time at Columbia University alongside Foggy Nelson, the two had stumbled into Elektra, who looked to enroll as a new student, but was also being escorted around the campus by the university president and her bodyguard. 
Where several days pass following the incident, Matt Murdock has Foggy Nelson provide a distraction by throwing a paper airplane in front of Elektra and her bodyguard. Investigating the source and leaving Elektra behind, Matt makes his appearance known by offering Elektra a rose. Now the significance of this is that Miller establishes two main ideas that I'd like you to keep in the back of your head. The first is that Elektra is of Greek descent and her father is a man involved in the criminal underworld. And the second is that this leads into how Elektra became an enemy of Matt. Where Matt offers to take Elektra on a date, the issue of his blindness arises when she declines the offer for fear of the situation seeming awkward. However, because Matt views her in such a way, instead of allowing her to escape, he pursues further and even goes so far as to explain how he lost his sight in the first place. Now, whether Elektra chooses to go on a date with Matt for his bravery in pushing an old man out of danger and being hit with radioactive material, or because he states that he's never told anyone that story before, is not revealed here, and in truth, Frank Miller didn't want it to be. The reason why is that when Miller took over the Daredevil title, his goal was to make both Matt Murdock and his supporting characters more believable, meaning that instead of answering every single question that we as the reader had, on multiple occasions, Miller would simply leave it up to us to develop our own answers. And so while we would never see this date occur, what we're told is that over the course of the next several weeks, the two fall in love, leading to a very passionate relationship that lasts around one year. However, while preparing to get together with Elektra and celebrate her birthday, when both Matt and Foggy arrive at her dorm room, they realize a gathering has emerged in light of the building being surrounded by a police barricade. Taking to a rooftop and using his senses to listen in on the situation, Miller reveals that Elektra and her father have been held hostage by a group of criminals who are currently negotiating with the police. Now something I'd like you to take notice of here is that even if it's only in bits and pieces, Miller uses this flashback to explain some of Murdoch's abilities, including his cunning, his ability to leap distances beyond those of normal humans, and even his agility in negotiating the various terrains and obstacles he faces in pursuing foes. Now where Daredevil is able to sneak into the building and begin taking out criminals, his actions also come with a valuable lesson, and that while he can control himself and does possess enhanced senses, he cannot account for the actions of others. Now this is an extremely important part of his character and went towards developing the nature of Daredevil as a hero. But the way in which he learns this lesson comes when he overpowers the criminals and sends one of them out of the window. Because the police officers below were unable to differentiate between who was an enemy and who was a hostage, their belief is that the criminals are killing the hostages, after which they fire on the building, killing Elektra's father in the process. As a result, and after an unknown amount of time, Elektra eventually leaves Matt Murdock after having become disillusioned with the laws of the United States and that the police aren't prosecuted for the murder of her father, as well as the idea that people in the world are inherently evil. Now where Daredevil comes to after this flashback, Miller also establishes that between the time she left and her sudden appearance in Hell's Kitchen, Murdock did not know anything about what had happened to Elektra, and while he would normally look into the possibility of rekindling the former relationship between the two, in the end, as a hero, his role is to keep her from killing Wallenquist and bring her to justice for her actions as a bounty hunter. From here, we transition to another part of Hell's Kitchen and pick up with Wallenquist himself and a man named Eric Slaughter. Now, Eric Slaughter is actually not a new creation in this story and first appeared with Daredevil issue number 159. As he was created by Robert McKenzie, Eric Slaughter was a crime boss who used his wealth to hire various criminals in an attempt to kill Daredevil. While he was occasionally hired by other individuals like Bullseye, Overall, Slaughter rarely acted on his own and used henchmen to achieve his goals. In this instance, Slaughter has been hired by Wallenquist who has committed a series of unknown crimes in Europe, but also witnessed a murder making him the key component to a trial. As a result, Wallenquist is being pursued by Elektra who looks to collect the bounty for his European crimes, as well as Daredevil who looks to keep him alive so he can offer testimony at the trial. And so where Slaughter receives a call from Bilge informing him that everything has been set up to get Wallenquist out of the country alive, it's revealed that this phone call is being made under the threat of Elektra killing Bilge in order to draw Wallenquist out into the open. Following this, where Bilge had stated that the seaplane would be ready at around 4 a.m., because the actual time was 3 a.m., Slaughter reveals that the statement was meant to indicate whether or not Bilge had been captured by Elektra, and that by providing the incorrect time, Slaughter's been made aware of Elektra's actions, allowing him to stay one step ahead. Taking the opportunity to also send one of his henchmen to a local cigar store in order to resupply his stash of cigars, Daredevil seizes the opportunity to kidnap the henchman after realizing that if Bilge was involved, so was Slaughter, and that it was only a matter of time before he sent someone to fetch cigars. Now something I'd also like you to notice here is how Daredevil interrogates Mickey. While Daredevil threatens to kill him, he doesn't really act on it so much as he uses the experience to terrorize Mickey. The reason why I brought this up is that prior to Frank Miller's run, Daredevil didn't really threaten people with death. 
where he would hang them from buildings and scare them a bit. The mention of killing them went towards the darker element of Daredevil, who was more akin to Batman of the 1970s and his willingness to push the limits to achieve his goal. And so transitioning to the west side waterfront at around 4am, we pick up with Slaughter and his henchmen encountering Elektra with the intention of taking her prisoner. However, because her expertise in martial arts predates her college years with Matt Murdock, her formidable skill set allows her to easily overpower Slaughter's men. Something to also take note of here is that while Miller doesn't explain it in any kind of backstory, with Elektra being offered a position in Slaughter's organization, she turns it down under the idea that she doesn't serve any cause, law, or man. Now the reason why this matters is that with the death of her father leaving her dissolution with laws and society, her role as a bounty hunter fulfills her desire for revenge, but also allows her to deliver justice according to her own moral compass and outside the context of laws of society, which she may or may not view as being adequate. Now I'd like you to keep this in the back of your mind and the reason why is because as we continue through this video, and especially once we jump into the Daredevil Netflix series proper, this particular bit will basically establish that Elektra is not a traditional villain in the form of someone like Kingpin. Instead, she's more of a blend between Punisher and Daredevil and that Murdoch upholds the color of law, bringing criminals to justice in the courts, and Frank Castle simply kills criminals without remorse. Elektra, on the other hand, uses her own moral code to decide which contract she takes, and only takes those contracts that she deems to be worthy. And so with Daredevil arriving but finding Elektra held at gunpoint by Wallenquist, with Matt being instructed to walk away, he also realizes that Wallenquist will shoot him in the back as soon as he's far enough. Using his senses to detect Wallenquist's movements, at the moment before he fires, Daredevil disarms Wallenquist by shouting, hit him low olive oil. Now because this is the same phrase that he had shouted when he and Elektra were fighting the criminals in her dorm room, Elektra comes to the realization that Matt Murdock is Daredevil. But because she leads a criminal life and Daredevil leads the life of a hero, it's essentially impossible for the two of them to mend their rift, meaning that whenever she appears in Hell's Kitchen, under normal circumstances, Daredevil will almost always be there to stop her. Now following her initial appearance and going forward into the Daredevil series, Elektra became one of the most important women in Marvel alongside Jean Grey, Storm, Carol Danvers, and Emma Frost. The reason for this is that where Jean Grey represented the evolution of women from background characters to prominence, Storm represented independence, Carol Danvers represented success, and Emma Frost represented ingenuity, Elektra represented all of these things. As a character who followed her own path and refused to be pinned down to any one ideology or employer, Elektra was a reflection of the very essence of feminist ideals, depicting a strong, independent woman who could endure virtually any situation on her own. While this did draw the attention of women, particularly young girls, it also drew the attention of a lot of younger men. The reason for this came in the sexuality of Elektra in terms of how she was depicted, but also because of the history of Daredevil comics themselves. What I mean here is that where Daredevil had multiple love interests, the most notable being Karen Page, who was a character that debuted in issue number one and was revamped by Frank Miller to be a heroin addict and a pornographic actress, there had never really been an instance where Murdoch had fallen in love with a woman who would go on to become his opposite in terms of their moral compass and equal regarding their fighting prowess. This combined with the fact that Elektra created an internal struggle for Murdoch and that he still harbored feelings for her, went towards the idea of creating stories with richer character development that focus on having Elektra and Daredevil serve as both allies and enemies. As an example, with issue number 174 in 1981 titled The Assassination of Matt Murdock, Frank Miller introduced the mystical ninja organization known as The Hand, who had also been hired to kill Daredevil. Coming together alongside Melvin Potter, a martial artist operating under the name Gladiator, the involvement of Elektra came in that she had overheard members of The Hand plotting to kill Daredevil. While she didn't intend to become involved, her love for Matt ultimately drove her to Hell's Kitchen, where she warned Matt Murdock of the coming assassination attempt, which allowed him to defeat The Hand. However, in issue number 179 titled Somebody Had to Win, Elektra became the chief assassin of Kingpin, where she was tasked with killing reporter Ben Urich due to his investigative journalism coming close to uncovering the criminal activities of Wilson Fisk. While her appearances in the Daredevil line of stories under Frank Miller only lasted a handful of issues, her popularity as an on-again, off-again ally of Daredevil coupled with the romantic tension between the two elevated her to one of Daredevil's most popular supporting characters, with some fans arguing that she was just as popular as Matt Murdock himself. Now having said all of that, while I haven't been able to find a reason as to why Frank Miller killed her off, I had a conversation with Sal over at Comic Pop, and we came to the conclusion that with Frank Miller looking to evolve the character of Daredevil and revolving his life around dark and tragic circumstances, it made sense to kill off Elektra, who fans viewed as a potential love interest of Daredevil, but also provide a circumstance wherein his character could be expanded on further regarding how he coped with the loss of an individual he had known for so long and viewed as both an enemy and a friend. 
Coming out of issue number 179, which ended with Elektra being defeated by Daredevil following her attempts to kill Ben Yurik, where her actions in terrorizing Yurik drove the Daily Bugle to abandon their segment on investigating Kingpin, because Daredevil had interfered, Kingpin sent Elektra to kill Foggy Nelson as an intimidation tactic to keep Matt Murdock away. While Elektra had intended to go through with the assassination, after being informed by Foggy that he recognizes her as one of Daredevil's ex-girlfriends from college, for reasons unexplained, Elektra simply abandons the assignment, allowing Foggy to leave. Following this, and because Bullseye had been looking to take Elektra's position as Kingpin's assassin, he takes the opportunity to capitalize on her momentary weakness, which culminates in Bullseye stabbing her through the chest with one of her own weapons. As a result, while Elektra didn't die immediately, after making her way to Murdoch's home and dying in his arms, a battle ensued between Murdoch and Bullseye, leading to Daredevil dropping Bullseye from a power line, almost killing him in the process. Now, while Frank Miller would resurrect Elektra and then remove her from the Daredevil title in the two-part story, Siege and Resurrection, in truth, I don't really have an answer as to why this was done. When Elektra had died in issue number 181, Miller had undertaken the step necessary to begin making Murdoch darker with issue number 184, titled No More Mr. Nice Guy, during his fight with the Punisher, and issue number 187 in a conversation he had with Black Widow. But regardless of his motives, at the conclusion of issue number 190, Frank Miller established that Elektra would never return to the Marvel landscape. However, in 1993, underwriter D.G. Chichester and editor-in-chief Tom DeFalco, the decision was made to return her to the comic book landscape with a five-part story Fall from Grace. Serving as a way to reinvent the Daredevil character by having Matt Murdock take on a new name of Jack Badalin after his father, don a new armor costume and fashion new weapons for himself, the return of Elektra came in the form of a retcon to explain why her character had appeared in all white at the end of Daredevil issue number 190. What we're told is that when she had been resurrected, her essence had split into two separate beings, one which was pure evil and one which was pure good. Designed to reflect the dichotomy between her heroic and anti-heroic self, at the conclusion of the story, Elektra had destroyed the physical body of her evil half, restoring it unto herself and officially returning to the Marvel landscape. Following this, in order to ensure that existing fans of the Daredevil series had a better understanding of her character, in 1995, Chichester returned to write the four-part series Elektra Root of Evil, which looked to use the information provided over the course of Elektra's run in the main Daredevil series, as well as her miniseries by Frank Miller, and provide a more accessible story for both new and existing fans. Told in a series of flashbacks between the present day and the past, Chichester reveals that at 12 years old, Elektra had been inducted into the cast, an order of martial artists similar to the Hand, but led by Stick, the former mentor of Daredevil, who occasionally operates as both ally and villain to Matt Murdock. During her time under Stick's tutelage, Elektra's days were spent in the icy terrain of the cast order in an unknown location where she was trained in the art of survival, self-defense, and mysticism. During this story, Chichester also established that Elektra's mother had been killed by Orestes, the enigmatic brother of Elektra, who had only appeared around seven times in Marvel Comics. Where her mother was gunned down due to her extramarital affairs, Elektra survived and was born prematurely, during which time she was raised in the wealthy life of her father's criminal empire until she was attacked by kidnappers at nine years old, after which her father determined she needed a martial arts master. With the story jumping forward to Elektra at 19 years old, Chichester maintains the original death of her father in Daredevil issue number 168 are providing an updated version of Hugo's death at the hands of the police during a botched kidnapping. While the rest of the origin would go on to connect with her encounter with Matt Murdock, Following this four-issue series, in addition to making appearances within the Daredevil series proper, her character also became a part of the overarching Marvel lineup, including Wolverine, the Enemy of the State storyline, where Logan was brainwashed and began attacking enemies of the Hand and Hydra, as well as Frank Miller's five-part miniseries Daredevil The Man Without Fear, which revisited and expanded on the history of Elektra by exploring her early days of her relationship with Daredevil. While some of these stories would involve her acting as an agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. under Nick Fury, and others would see her teaming up with Spider-Man, as a character that had been such an integral part of Daredevil's history and extremely popular among new readers who looked to understand why older fans wanted her to return, the success of Elektra led to a solo series in 1996 and 2001 written by Peter Milligan and Brian Michael Bendis respectively, both of whom used the stories to explain how Elektra viewed the world prior to her murder by Bullseye and her resurrection by the Hand. While each has been considered landmark in their own right with Milligan's run focusing heavily on Elektra coming to grips with her life following her murder and resurrection, as well as Bendis providing a more updated series to reflect the modern reader. At the conclusion of Bendis' run in 2004 going into the launch of House of M, like many of Marvel's popular heroes and villains, Elektra was revamped within the pages of the tie-in comic House of M Avengers No. 3, where she was revealed to be an agent of the Kingpin but was defeated by Iron Fist Danny Rand. Following this, and with Marvel launching Civil War, 
Electra actually didn't make any appearances in the Civil War event itself, and the reason for this was revealed in the post-Civil War story titled Secret Invasion when it was revealed that prior to the House of M event, the shape-shifting scrolls had been secretly replacing humans and superpowered beings alike with scroll replacements following their planned destruction by Galactus. Where the scroll threat was first discovered by Nick Fury during his time underground following the Fury Secret War storyline, the heroes of Earth becoming aware of the scroll threat came when Elytra was revealed to be one of the aliens following her death. While the conclusion of Secret Invasion would see Tony Stark deposed, S.H.I.E.L.D. disbanded and replaced with the agency Hammer led by Norman Osborn, aside from a few appearances in Code Red where she fought alongside Deadpool, Punisher, and others and attempting to kill the mercenary Domino, as well as the 2010 Shadowlands story which saw Daredevil building the Shadowland prison in Hell's Kitchen, New York, drawing the attention of Spider-Man, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and others against him, in truth, Elektra didn't actually see much attention in the way of Marvel. While some attribute this to the idea that her popularity had run its course while others believed that Marvel didn't really have a strong place to put her, in 2013 and 2014 during the events leading up to the launch of Secret Wars, underwriter Daniel Way, Elektra was rolled over into the Thunderbolts alongside the Punisher, Deadpool, Venom, and Red Hulk, operating as a strike team under the direction of Red Hulk himself. While the series only lasted 32 issues, the combination of these characters as a team drew the attention of multiple readers due to its strange makeup. And so using this popularity as a platform, in 2014, debut writer W. Haddon Blackman launched the third Electra Solo series with a five-part story Bloodlines. Looking to the history of her character, for many, Blackman's run was considered extremely well-written due to Blackman taking the stance that various writers had tried too hard to recapture the legacy of Electra instead of living up to what it was that made her popular. To this end, instead of writing a series of wildly convoluted stories and team-ups, instead, Blackman took Elektra's character back to what it was that made her great in the eyes of fans in the first place, being an assassin for hire. And so while the title had its ups and downs, lasting around 11 issues after which it was cancelled at the start of Secret Wars, for individuals who were looking to receive a complete understanding of her character ranging from her younger days, stretching up through her experiences dying and being resurrected, as well as finding her place in the world, the Blackman run is usually pointed to the very definition of the place to start for those individuals who are looking to get into the Electra character. With that being said, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end, and make sure you post a comment down below and let me know what you think about Electra, and I will catch you guys later. Peace.